Do a job that you love, you never work a day in your life. Smile and enjoy. The mastery of emotional intelligence. The ability to be the butt of jokes for others, especially those who work for you, lightens the atmosphere, enables them to get to know you, trust you. And you know what happens when people trust you? They go the extra mile. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and comedy, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is one of the world's leading business gurus, specializing in leadership, culture and transformation. As a top executive coach, he walks the walk. And having been chairman, CEO and MD of Blue Chip Businesses, he also definitely talks the talk. He has shared stages with the biggest business behemoths and boardrooms with the brilliant leadership trailblazers. His seminal book, Spike, encourages people to focus on inherent strengths. His many strengths were recognized when, a few years ago, the Queen awarded him an MBE. René Carriol, welcome to the Humorology podcast. That's a hell of an opening. It's all down from here, Paul. It's going. <laughs> well, fortunately, it's about humour, Rene. So, um, first question, is humour important in business? Um, not just important, essential. Look, in a tough, fast place, stressful, highly competitive, difficult, ambiguous world, which is quite unforgiving, um... That's a tough old place to walk into every day, knowing that you're going to be a bunch, be amongst a bunch of people who don't take themselves too seriously, who will take time out to just laugh at themselves, laugh with each other, and just care for each other. How fabulous. And, you know, at the moment, as we're, many of us are working from home, it's even more important. And clocking in to see how someone is and having a moment, to just see, are you okay? Have a laugh, a bit of brevity, break some of the monotony of the moment. Everyone knows productive, productivity is going through the roof, but morale may not where, be where it needs to be. So a little, especially if it's from your line manager. How wonderful is that? They're not coming in to say, how are the KPIs? How's the old profit line? But to say, just to have a laugh and laugh at themselves. If the boss laughs at themselves, then everyone relaxes a little bit more and tries a little bit harder. Uh, that's fascinating because that thing, if the boss laughs at, uh, laughs at themselves. So do you intrinsically think that it starts at the top? So we always say that if the leader can, is comfortable going to their vulnerable edge, you know, letting their teams know that they're fallible too. They make mistakes too. An attitude of the only mistake is the one we don't learn from. You know, the old Covey story. The leader takes their team through the darkest jungle. It's four days. It's dengue fever. It's malaria. It's chopping through the undergrowth. They're running out of water. People are getting a bit tetchy. The leader climbs up the tallest tree, looks around and shouts out, hey, guys, wrong jungle. <laughs> thinking, Hang on a minute. He's lost his marbles. No, that makes you more human people will actually trust you even more because you fessed up. I don't want to spoil this podcast by bringing up the name Dominic Cummings, but wouldn't it have been different if he just fessed up? If he just said, you know what? I got it wrong, guys. I panicked. I stepped out of line. I'm really sorry. Being Brits would have forgiven him in seconds. For our international list, li listeners, I'm probably thinking they have heard of Dominic Cummings, but Dominic Cummings is the advisor to Boris Johnson, our prime minister, who... Um, managed to, well, I don't know if the word is gaslight people, but managed to try, say to people that he went on a 60 mile round trip to test his, his eyesight. And frankly, 
that is um, astonishing to me that somebody would think they would do it. And I think you're a hundred percent right. If yeah, you that fess moment, up, for your foreign listeners, that was taking the mick. <laughs> we can say it's a podcast. We can say taking the piss, Rene. Yes, <laughs> I mean, the one question when it was under review for you drove 60 miles test drives. I don't know why someone didn't just say you're taking the piss. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. But back to my point. The leader that's prepared to say I got it wrong, especially in a less than serious way, they're enabling everyone else around them to try harder without fear. It means that if I do fail, I know I can talk to the boss about it because he's not perfect either. Brilliant. What makes you laugh, Rennie? Nearly everything and anything. You know, I've, I've learned through life, in my younger days, when you're trying to climb up that greasy pole, I was a bit too intense, a bit too serious, never relaxing. Every day you're on show, every, every day you're on stage, and it wears you out. It just wears you out. And the prize you're aiming for is, doesn't feel that glittering when you get there. When you've worked 15, 16 hour days, you haven't smiled, you're a bit too intense. So I realized that you gotta break that up. Do a job that you love, you never work a day in your life. Smile and enjoy the mastery of emotional intelligence, the ability to be the butt of jokes for others, especially those who work for you, lightens the atmosphere, enables them to get to know you, trust you. And you know what happens when people trust you? They go the extra mile. Uh, I couldn't agree more, and it's lovely to, to hear you actually put it in those terms, because as somebody who executive coaches people all the time, do you have to remind the people that you are working with that that is as important, that humanizing factor, as you put it. So one of the jobs I have to do on a regular basis, far too often for my likings, is to have that, to take someone for lunch knowing that I'm the only one coming back. Right, so it's, it's in the executive team, it hasn't worked, we've signposted it, we've signaled it, you've had the, the, um, you've had the appraisals, we've had the management, managing performance, we've done everything. And there's nowhere else to go now. And I've got to have that very difficult conversation. And we're going to go to lunch. And believe you me at that, at that moment when it's, I'm not forgetting for a moment it's someone's livelihood. I'm not forgetting for a moment that this is serious. It could be hurtful. But we can have a real conversation. I can share with them the times when I've been asked to leave. When it was my fault. Bring a bit of humour into it. Take the tension out of the environment. It's never a great moment. And that night, I know I'm not going to sleep because it's that serious. The day I sleep is the day I stop doing this. But I also know that in all the people I've had to be privy to, party to them going, there's only one person that's never spoken to me afterwards. And it's in hundreds. And I like to think those relationships, I retain them. It's important to me. And when they do leave that organization, I'm usually involved in helping them get their next position. And humour underlies that, that, you know, this may not be the best day of your life. But you know what? We're going to re remain friends through this. And I'm going to get you into an environment where you're better appreciated. That reminds me of uh, a quote from Dr. Richard Bandler, who said, um, you know, people say one day you're going to look back on this and laugh. Why wait? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Sounds like my daughter when she's asking for an increase in her allowance. <laughs> well, I, well, aren't children the best salespeople oh. in the world? No, especially you know? the most expensive daughter in the Northern Hemisphere, which I... <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, my son's uh, will, will uh, run her close, I think. Um, do you have any funny stories about something that's that happened to you that, that you can now laugh at? One of the low points in my career... You know, they're, they're, you get lots of low points, but you balance them out by finding that light touch within it. And it's, it's interesting one for this is in the moment that Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement is moving the racial tectonic plates in a way I've never seen. Back in the day, this is maybe eight, nine years ago, I get a call, it's a great gig. I'm doing a talk for Siemens you know, the Europe's largest electronics, and you could say technology company at the time. German, very well organized and brilliant at what they do. 
but I was first thing in the morning, I was giving a talk in Stockholm and then I was going to have to get to Dusseldorf to do in the afternoon. I'm going to be giving us, giving a talk, giving a keynote and interviewing the group chief executive. Okay. As life would have it, the flight from Stockholm is delayed. And all of a sudden, everything, and a member of my team, Jackie, she's in Dusseldorf waiting for me, setting everything up, and it was going to be tight anyway. I get a message on the phone. It says, um, when you land in, Ham in Dusseldorf, just come outside, and there'll be a motorbike rider waiting for you. Forget your luggage. You'll have a crash helmet. Get on the back, and we're going to get you to the gig on time. It's a bit James Bond. <laughs> uh, I land, I come out, leave my luggage, just go straight outside. This guy, I see him waving, I put on the crash helmet, I'm holding on to him. He doesn't even stay on the autobahn. He's going in and, and I just close my eyes. Before we know it, I'm soaked in sweat and I get there. Jump off, run to the front and the chief executive is there standing and he says, and Jackie's there, and, says, and they said, go to the back. If you go to the back, they're waiting for you at the back. Come straight on the stage at the back. Go straight on stage. We're ready for you to go. You've got five minutes. I sprint. Get to the back. When I get there, there's a man in uniform, and he says, I said, look, I've got to get on stage. My name's Rene Carroll. I'm coming on to do it. And he says, no one's passing. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've been told no one comes through this door. I said, no, no. Chief executive said, he says, no one's passing. I run back to the front. Get the chief executive, me and him, run to the back. We get there, and the guy says, no one's passing. He says, the do you know who I am speech. He says, I don't care who you are. No one's passing. We run back to the front. I go around the front, onto the stage, and do the gig. At the end of the gig, the chief executive says to me, I want you to come with me. He comes and go with him. We go to the back. The guy's there at the back, and he says, um, you do realise I'm the chief executive. You made him walk around the front, and he said to him, Fantastic job, well done. I like a man who sticks to their orders. All right? Germany. Anyway, finishes. I'm, not, I'm shocked. I'm, but it says everything about different cultures. Anyway, we shake hands. Got on really well. I run upstairs. I get changed, and I'm I'm going to be driving because we're going to the airport quickly. We've got a car there that Jackie's booked, which so we're driving to the airport. And when I run downstairs, Jackie's sitting in the car. It's a big black Mercedes S500, and I jump in the back. And um, as I jump in the back, I look in the front and there's the chief executive sitting in the front with his wife and no Jackie. At that moment, he says something. No, it's the other way around. He's sitting in the back. I'm sitting, I go in the front because I'm going to drive. He's sitting in the back with his wife. And I, he, he barks something, which my German's not brilliant, but even I could work out it was get a move on. I think, hang on a minute, this isn't what was planned. Jackie comes down, opens the front door, says, oh, are we giving them a lift? He looks, I look, there's another black Mercedes right in front of us with a driver in it. So we look at each other, we stare, and if the ground could open up to bury him, it would have done. I got out, he got out, we hugged, we laughed, nervously shook hands went our way when i got back to london which is a the following day that afternoon a classy case of champagne handwritten note apology and he said i taught you a lesson in the morning with the guy at the back you taught me a lesson in the afternoon thank you very much indeed Oh, that's an amazing, but actually for him to recognize that oh. was, was really a big thing for him. So tough moments, serious moment, humorous moments. Well, yeah. And what, and what bonded you together was the humor. We learned through wrong assumptions, but I think the big lesson there have the personality to diffuse the situation. Yes. Done very differently. Of course, yeah. And by the way, it was your attitude that changed the whole thing. And, and humour is about attitude, is it not? And I think so. And it's about accessibility. Don't take yourself too seriously. A little bit of emotional intelligence. Walk in the shoes of the other person. Well, that's, that's attitude and accessibility. I like that. I'm going to use that. Um, 
is everyone funny, Renny? Everyone can be. Some people don't want to be. But, you know, I think everyone can be. And it's, it's not about telling gags, telling jokes. Sometimes it's just that second look, that click. You know, the, um, and you see so many times when mothers are telling the kids off, she just pauses, smiles, and they run and go and do it. Because she's just created that little moment of laughter. Why wouldn't you? And it breaks all the tension. I, I just, sometimes I just wonder, especially when I look at some of our, the leaders of our biggest businesses, our heads of state, just that little moment, that wry little smile, that little wink, breaks all the tension. You know, I saw the other day when um, Jacinda Ahern, the fabulous Prime Minister of New Zealand, was being interviewed and there was an earthquake right on, it's on the set, in the middle of the set, and she went, oh, that was an earthquake. Do carry on. <laughs> it's just, just in the moment, just in that. And if you're head of state, he's not going to panic and take it seriously. What message did that send to The smile was what everyone saw. Wonderful. Genius. So why don't the people who don't get it, which I think would be the majority who don't get it, why don't they understand that? Is it, is it because they're too intense? They've got their attention on the bottom line or, uh, you know, on there's a bit the forecast? Of, there's a bit of a bit, you know, um, ego is the opposite of empathy. Empathy is the opposite of ego. And most, the great comedians have this amazing empathy with their audiences. They know, they seem to know instinctively where the boundaries are. And they'll go and touch the boundaries and just not go over the edge. Because the best humour is a little bit edgy. It's sort of finding the caricature in someone who's very serious. It's finding the soft underbelly of a serious moment. But not doing it in a way that undermines people, but just breaks the tension. And allows everyone just to breathe easily. I find, so normally I, I get involved with him interviewing big chief executive chairman. And my job normally is to ask the questions that no one would ever dare ask. But ask them in a way, for the audience it seems as though you're, my God, that's tough. That's straight talking. But I'm giving the boss a narrative, giving the leader a narrative, making them feel more human. And I remember doing John Varley when he was chief executive at Barclays. And I'd worked with John for three years. We're very close. And he never did a talk without me being there to interview him. And on this particular situation, it was a really tough moment. Really tough moment. And um, well, Bar Barclays going to need government bailing out or not. And I was coming out and we'd had this very intense, let me ask you again, are Barclays going to remain independent? And he said, I don't care how many times you ask me, I want to tell you straight, we are going to remain independent. And you could feel the tension in the room. And I said to him, so, he said, can we talk about something else? I said, yes, let's talk about your family. He said, I don't want to talk about my family. I said, I do. Everyone wants to listen about it. Said, no, I don't want to talk about it. He said, um, uh, look, I'm married, I've got two kids, I don't need to talk about it. I said, who are you married to? And he just froze, couldn't speak. Don't you have a name? And eventually he just burst out laughing. He said, it's Rachel. And all of us, it was just gold dust. You know, just gold dust. <laughs> and from that moment, it just made him more human. John was, I would say, I'd be privileged to one of the best leaders I've had the opportunity to work with. But he's a bit straight, a bit stiff. If you ask him a question, you'll get a forensic answer. It was no real room for anything. But after that moment, he just became more accessible. Well, is, isn't that the key, though? Is And you have to give him credit for, because you said that he always had you there for those three years um, interviewing him. So on some level, he recognised it. And We did an event once at the, the Globe, loads of Barclays people there, and um, one of the guys had just a little a glass too many. John was held up in a board meeting. I was holding the floor, tap dancing and waiting for him to come through. And because I was in my black suit, white shirt in uniform, waiting to interview John when he came in, he knows I'm holding the floor. Whenever he comes in, we'll, we'll get on it. And this guy comes up to me and he says, um, can I have another glass of chilled white wine, please? <laughs> I said, yes, of course. Sir. So I go down, come off the stage, go down, go to the catering team back, get him a glass of wine, come and give it to him. And um, the whole room just went, 
So he finishes that and comes up to me and says, can I have another glass of that chilled wine? I said, well, can you want? He said, no, can I have it now? And at that moment, John walks in and says, I'll get you the glass of wine. God, blimey. If you felt that everybody laughs, guess how he felt? It was just in a moment. And everyone in the room laughed. Everyone learned a lesson. And later on at the end, when we finished, he came up to me and went, I don't know what to say. I said, you don't have to say anything. Don't worry about this. It's cool. We all make mistakes. He said, I'm so, so sorry. I said, don't worry about it. We, uh, well, I mean, that's just indicative of, of um, great leadership to actually do that. But these things happen a lot. What, what's your, I mean, we are right in the midst when we're recording this of the Black Lives Matter. And they've just announced that certain comedy shows, which is relevant to what we're talking about, have been pulled. And I, I wanted to get your take on that and whether that is has an effect on the psyche because i i have a belief that it does but you know um let me know your thoughts you know, i'm surprised that people get heads up about it you know they pulled gone with the wind the other day and you know it happens to be one of my favorite films but i do have to swallow hard through some of it some of the scenes and the set pieces on slavery i prefer if they edited the film if i'm honest with you it just has no place today and I think that if we're really honest about this, nothing lasts forever. We know that. We're in a world that constantly changes. Today's pristine strategy is tomorrow's obsolescence. We get head up about the statues. Come on, those statues don't need to be there forever. They celebrated a particular time, a particular hero, did something amazing at a time. They don't last forever. And, you know, there'll come a time in the future when people look at Mandela and say, it's a bit dated. It's a bit irrelevant. His time is gone. The heroes, the Greek heroes, aren't Archimedes, Plato, Arist Aristotle, they don't have, they, we don't see them around anymore. The world just moves on, let's not get head up about it. And to me, today's heroes are tomorrow's obsolescence. That's just life. And to me, I, I was watching the, this morning on, on the news, they were saying that um, one of my favourite episodes of Basil Forty was highly inappropriate today. It happens. It just happens. There are enough great Basil Fawlty's to watch which don't have the goose stepping and the, you know, the rest of it. And let's, I don't want to denigrate John Cleese and Connie Booth at all, heroes of, of comedy, but there is appropriateness. And I think there's a generation now who weren't around then, didn't understand the context. The language has changed, the glossary of terms have changed. The inappropriateness. And sometimes I look back at the way women were portrayed on Miss World circa 1960, whatever. <laughs> you, you just cringe. Yeah. Comedy's not going to have to move. Well, you... I, I, I completely agree. And I, I don't think that anybody is, is missing love thy neighbour. Nobody's on the streets running around going, we need that because it was uh, indicative of the times. So yesterday, Harry Enfield was on Radio 4 right at the end. And he was talking about this humour, Black Lives Matter. And he used a term that was commonplace in Till Death Us Do Part back in the day. And the BBC got an avalanche of criticism. The world just moves on. And let's be clear, there are some people that can't move on. It's your problem. The rest of society is going to leave you behind. Well, uh, I just a little going a bit further with that um, you work with some of the biggest leaders in the world and you sort of do the keynotes and you, you you rub shoulders with those leaders it's also incumbent on the leaders to show not just from a laughter point of view but from uh, what is tolerant kind of view and isn't that why we're sort of in the place we are now when you have a leader I'll call it out I'll say like Trump who isn't um so uh, it's true. putting people some things are happening that have never happened. Uh, you know me and some of my mates people of color we've grown up in central london in the inner city and some of the things and whatever you choose to call it they're all given different names as it systemic racism is it unconscious bias is it institutionalized racism is it implicit bias all those sort of things that we've lived with all our lives and in many respects shoved shoved aside and got on with it 
we, uh, you get to 60 and you think, it's not going to change in my generation. In two weeks, the tectonic plates of race have moved more than they've moved in the six years I've been on the planet. It's unbelievable. And if I think of the lives that have been lost and sacrificed, for all the noise that we're getting from those who 137,000 people marched, 135 were arrested. Why are we talking about the 135 and not the 137,000? Perspective. Uh, it's more has been done in two weeks, but I'm really, I, I feel really positive about this because I think, do you know what? There's always going to be a, two or three people who go over the top, but let's look at the mainstream. My other half is she's of Indian origin and her daughter Priya is 13. And because they're all studying online from home at the moment, the school rang up, rang my other half and said, um, your daughter has put her hand up and said she wants to go on the Black Lives Matter march. She says, um, and when I asked the rest of the class what they thought, half the class put up their hands and said they want to go as well. So I'm going to socially distance them, but I'm going to escort them. Okay, are you comfortable with that? That's the reality. In my time, that would never have happened. And, my, and Shivata's saying to me, what do you think? I said, I don't think they're asking for your permission. I think they're going. <laughs> and we both stood at each other, laughed, just thought, you know what? How wonderful is that? Well, and we, I mean, I think it is wonderful. And, you know, my son's of the same opinion. My son's 19 and he has that. There's a completely different mindset, which is so refreshing that they, they, they're presuming everybody is the same be, before looking for difference. You know, you know they're, cool. quite, they're quite shocked to see dif- that anybody else is seeing it not through their eyes. And I, I love that. It's going to happen. It won't be managed. It's not going to be clean and nice. It won't have a KPI. It won't have a, a business plan. It is going to happen. And I think neutrality, you're opposing it. It's like lots of things are happening today. You know, you can't prevent the smartphone. Without that smartphone, that picture of George Floyd would not be taken. You can't prevent social media. So let's take it with good humour, embrace it, and be part of the change and on the right side of history. Exactly. And I think humour actually plays into it a lot. Because you just mentioned the smartphone, but actually we now have uh, the ability to send text messages and, and messages with funny things you know with pictures of you know trump saying things like uh i did not say those things you heard thought i you heard me say you know and what does that do humor pricks the bubble of hypocrisy and now everybody can instantly send a meme that pricks that bubble so i think uh, humor is also um a force for good in that sense. Oh, it is one diffuses any tension. I was in South, I did a lot of work in South Africa. I was working with Barkers Africa, Absa Bank, and their leadership there. And one Saturday morning, I'm in a swimming pool in Houghton. And there's a bunch of guys, maybe eight and ten guys playing water polo. They're probably in their 50s. They're not that brilliant, but they're thoroughly enjoying themselves. And I look behind me. There's a small black guy sitting behind me, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. And I just think, whoa. Anyway, when they finish, they're all cheering, laughing. So they've obviously come in there every week and they play and someone's keeping the score and, I, and they're, they're having a joke. And he wanders up and says, excuse me, gentlemen, um, what game is this? And they say, water polo. And they're all standing to attention, being very polite in their speedos. And he says, um, why are there no black players? He said, well, we're just a bunch of friends from university. We've been doing this for the last 25 years or so. We just turn up on a Saturday and we play. And he says, but why don't I black play? He said, um, it's not a sport that's never really gripped the black people. They don't really get into the swimming. They don't really get into the water play. He says, if I come next week, will you teach me how to play? And walks off. Wonderful. Oh. They, we all laugh a little nervously, but what a lovely little lesson. And to use a little bit of humour just to lodge a little message in someone's mind. Confrontation is a waste of time. Find a different way of doing it. Well, well what would the world be like without humour? Oh, barren. Barren. Too serious. Do you know, so I'm 
my next door neighbour, lovely woman, Michelle. She can moan for England. You know, no matter what day of the week is, she's going to moan. We're at the gate, and um, and she says, uh, what's happened with the post? Post is getting later and later and later. And at that moment, up comes Pete. Been our postie for the last 25, 30 years. So I thought, I'm going to kill this. So Pete, what's happening with the post? Michelle tells me it's, it's getting later and later. He looks a bit sheepish, looks up, and he says, um, she's right. It is getting a bit later. I think, oh, no. That's the last thing I needed to hear. He's going to feed the beast. And he said, um, it's Roger at 88. He's getting on a bit. He's losing his eyesight. I don't just give him his post now. I sit down and read it out to him every day. Oh. Oh. And I look for Michelle. She's gone. She's not going to be moaning anymore, is she? She's gone. (laughs) And I think there's a lesson here, Paul, that I love. People say to me, what do I do during the pandemic? How do I get through the crisis? Look out for each other, look after each other. If that's all we do, the world would be a better place. Find the moment to smile. Just find a moment to have a little smile. But also, laugh at yourself and oh. laughter. Do you think that's important as well? The day we lose the ability to laugh at ourselves, give it up. And in a way, I take as... So there's a couple of interesting facts here. It's there is no nation led by a woman that's handling the coronavirus badly. That's the first point. No nation led by a woman is doing it badly. The top 15 nations for infections and deaths are all run by alpha males. Big, Trump, Boris, Erdogan in Turkey, China, they're all big, powerful. Don't listen. Don't collaborate. Don't laugh at themselves. No sense of humour. Take themselves too seriously. The only voice you can hear. Didn't take the coronavirus seriously at the start, they all started late behind the eight ball. Whereas what happened with the women? They didn't take themselves too seriously. They took the pandemic seriously. They kicked it off really early. As we sit here in London, we got the mess of quarantine or not, lockdown or not, open stores or not. There's no clarity. And actually, I think the thing about humour is that it, it it levels off everything. And also, humour builds to a point. You know, there's a point to it. You've got to get to the punchline. Yes. So m- maybe there is a correlation between sort of understanding humour and getting stuff done. I mean, do you think there's enough humour in the workplace? So I, I spent 10 years working at Marks & Spencer's. We had a company archivist, Paul Bookbinder, and he's keep up the story of Marks and Spencers, who's over 100 years old and all that sort of stuff. And um, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I'd heard him speak, he told a little story. You know those little stories in the workplace? Our chief executive, Rick Greenbury, was, he was brilliant, a genius, but everyone was petrified of him. And Paul tells a story that, well, he's got into the lift, he's coming to to work a bit late and he's trying to get to his desk as soon as he can he's 20 minutes late and just as the lift door closes rick greenbury presses the lift door and as the doors open he comes and he says late again bookbinder and he says yes so am i sir yes so am i (laughs) (laughs) and he's just in the workplace and all of a sudden rick was made to be human (laughs) brilliant um if i asked you to write a uh, business case for humor what would you include in it? Very straightforward. Happy people equals happy customers. Done. And is that, because as a psychologist, what I think, I always like the saying that if you want anybody, I always like the saying that if you want anybody to go into any state, you have to go into that state first. And isn't that true of every level of business? If you're pushing your people too hard, if their fear of failure is high and they're not prepared to step outside of the envelope because they, they fear retribution or being scolded, make them happy. It's, you can tell when you walk into any restaurant whether the people that are coming to serve you are happy. And if they're happy, what, what does it do for the mood music for the evening? As opposed to if they're so scared, they're asking every three minutes, everything okay, okay, and some, as opposed to having a conversation with you, having a smile. So we say very simply, happy people, happy customers, happy profits. 
So that would be your return on investment, really. If you, it, it, it's a huge ROI, isn't it? To, that have you actually seen the this? ROI oh. I like is return on involvement. Oh, oh! Uh, tell me a little bit more about that then. No, well, I think that the, the the days when the leader solved every problem, initiated every strategy, made every decision—they're long gone. They're long yeah. gone. The world's too fast moving, too ambiguous, too complex nowadays. Every voice needs to be heard. And those close to the customer have most of the ideas. So collaboration is the new leadership. ROI is return on involvement. Get everyone involved. Have you ever taken a joke too far or, you know, crossed the line? As it oh, just about every day. The beauty of what I do every day with, with my other half, the only reason I get away with it is that she's even worse than I am. So... <laughs> I'll always overstep that little bit and she's fast at coming. She can hold her own and we do, but you know, it's what keeps us together. You know, there's never a day that we don't, where she's not ribbing me, I'm not ribbing her. And there's, and because we're close and know each other really well, we finish off each other's sentences, no holds barred. So when I'm taking myself a little bit too seriously, it's three o'clock in the morning, I'm still trying to find the closer to that piece I'm doing. I can predict what's coming out of the bedroom. It's abuse. You know, it's not, <laughs> total abuse. No holds barred. And I'll, I can't help myself. I'll laugh and I'm back in there. When you're working with sort of um, leaders in business, do you take some of that? Because I do. Uh, I must say, I, I find that a teasing attitude, as I call it, actually has much more efficacy when you're trying to persuade somebody to change. Love it. And I, I think I'd go even a stage further that nowadays, I think we used to look, we were obsessed with the best person for the job. Today, we look for the best person in the team. And every leader is as unique as their fingerprints, so their team needs to be unique to compensate for the things they're not so good at. It's no longer fees for one person to be that broad, but the team can be that broad. And what I always look for in a team, who's the diffusing agent? Who's the person that when it all gets a bit tough, they're going to break the ice with a little bit of humour? Who's the person that's going to volunteer, but knowing full well they're the last person on earth you would give this task to? But because they've taken the responsibility of volunteering, it slightly embarrasses everyone else. There's a break in the atmosphere. People laugh. You, you can't possibly do it. No, leave it with me. I'll, I'll, I'll take off you. And we, you need that person. The person who's prepared to push themselves forward, not afraid to, you know, it's the court jester from back in the day. To say the things that the king wanted said, but say in a jocular way that breaks all the tension. But you know they're making a serious point. That court jester wasn't the corporate fool. They were the person who had the courage to say the things that no one dare, but do it in a way that diffused the tensions. I just love the term diffusing agent. And, you know, with, you know, sort of uh, Fortune 500 companies, do you think they should be actually putting ads in the paper, wanted, diffusing agent, must wear bells on his hat? You know, but I'm serious, actually. I know you are. We have them. We, you know everywhere you've worked, you've had them. And it's male or female, Jew or Gentile, old or young, it's that person that, and sometimes they've got the most deadpan face you've ever seen in the world. But it's the timing, the moment. Just when someone's head is about to be cleaved off, a little intervention, and everyone leans back again. That, I, I think that's a fascinating that somebody who has worked at high in organizations all around the world as you actually recognizes that this is a key component of something that actually can affect the bottom line. Paul, um, sometimes it has to be me, but I'm role modeling it for someone else. So can you imagine I'm in the, I'm in the executive suite, 16 of us with, the business is the largest flotation in Europe in 2017. They've had two profit warnings for the two previous quarters. If the third one, the chief he said, I'm looking after is gone. We're in there looking at the numbers. They do not look good. Can you imagine the atmosphere? When the chairman has already called me in and said that three strikes and he's out. And we're in there 
and I can see the numbers. There's a few negative surprises. And I say, stop. Can we just stop for a moment? I said, um, everyone who's spoken has been slightly less than the person before. Can you guys swap chairs a bit so that we get a bit of good news before we get to the end of the bad news? And the tension just stopped. It, every, everyone just stopped. And two of the guys said, can we take a 10 minute break? I'd like to go and revisit my numbers. When they came back, they had the right answers. Don't know how they juggled it. We got the right answers. We avoided what was going to be just the inevitable departure of the chief executive. Without the little joke of changing chairs, because as far as I was concerned, it's all over by the shouting. But sometimes just take a moment and we change the course of history. Do you think that enough companies are realising this or enough businesses? I mean, this could, you know, because our listeners are small companies, they're big corporates, they're everyone, are realising the actual power that lies beneath of this. No. And no, they're not. And I think what's interesting is when it happens, it, it's remembered by everyone and it doesn't go away. You know, the, and it's little moments. And, you know, the, the thing about the little moments is they become stories. Those stories get fed into the corporate grapevine. Those stories, is, they're usually catching people doing things right. They change the culture better than any engagement survey, than any bunch of consultants. Just a story where my people did things brilliantly and I'm going to praise them and push it down into the, the grapevine. So I looked after Ralph Hammers, Chief Executive of ING Bank. I was there at the beginning with him. He's been there seven, he's just been announced Ralph is going to be Chief Executive of UBS Bank now. And I'm going to do the final interview for him which I did the first one. But sort of a year in, and it was an austerity period. The Dutch government had just bailed out ING Bank to the tune of 9 billion euros. And for the first Christmas, Ralph says, um, we've got to send the right messages. No big parties, no big expenditure. But if you want to have a party, have them in your offices. You can wear frocks and black tie, but in your offices, okay? So I get invited to Ralph's party. And it's black tie, it's frocks, and everyone's coming with their partners. And it's a really nice old do, low-key, Amsterdam, cheap and cheerful, but... On, on message and um and his group hr director hein comes in and Hein's a good friend of mine he's got introduced me into the organization in the first place and Hein comes in and everyone who's coming in as you come in ralph and his wife are standing at the door and they shake the hands of the male partner and ralph would instinctively kiss the female partner on both cheeks in a very european way and they'd go Hein comes in, and Hein had been out for many years. It was clear to all of us that, you know, Hein was gay, Hein was very proud of it, and, you know, but he'd always talked to me about his partner, but I'd never met him. Hein turns up with his partner, and he's the most disgracefully handsome Cuban modern dancer you have ever seen. And he's too handsome for words, and sculpted, and they look special together. As they come in, Ralph and his wife, they just instinctively shake hands with Hein and instinctively Ralph kisses his partner on both cheeks the way he'd done everyone else. And they came in. And none of us said anything, but symbolically, Paul, it was just beautiful. You couldn't have scripted it. And yeah. it set an atmosphere. Anyway, about three minutes later, I get a text on my phone from the head of communications for ING, who's a good mate of mine. He says, is it true? Hein came in with his butt, you know, in, within three minutes. Guess what that does for diversity and inclusion at ING? Yes. Sometimes it's just that little story. And for those of us in the room, we were beaming for the rest of the No one said anything about it. But it just, what a wonderful atmosphere to celebrate Christmas in. Oh, 100%. Actually, going to the opposite end of this, have you ever gotten into trouble through using humour? Constantly. <laughs> I think on occasion, you know, and I'll tell you where I get in trouble most of the time, when I'm seeing the boss, usually the chief executive or the chairman, going a little too far in a public situation. You know, we, we know the rules. We praise in public, we tell off in private. But every now and again, you know, none of us are perfect. 
And my job usually is to stand between them. And is it, and I'm not, never sure, is it defending the more junior person or is it defending the more senior person? I don't know which one it is. I just know that it's wrong. And the first 15 seconds, and what I always try and do is use a bit of humour. You couldn't repeat that, could you? Or um, could you say that any louder? And, you know, and at that moment, you see the eye... The first five seconds, or no, it's two seconds, are pretty ropey. But everyone's usually smart enough to know it's just saved me from going completely OTT in public. But you've got to swallow hard. I still get the dry throat. You still get the sweaty palms. But, you know, you've got to say, um, wow, could you say that any louder than you did? And everyone ducks for cover. What I'm really saying is get a hold of yourself as quickly as you possibly can. But is that easier being somebody who is not in the, the moment? Because I think I have the not same thing. Not being on the payroll I... really helps. Not being on the payroll is what really helps. It's yeah. very hard for a direct report to say that if you're part of the body politic, you're part of the corporate. But, you know, it's still hard when you're not on the payroll. Even though I know I'm, I can't be fired, but I can still be escorted off the premises. And I've had that <laughs> <laughs> well, but by the way, I would say that you're doing your job really well if you're escorted off the premises because you are following your instincts. And what I suspect is that the court jesters weren't uh, PAYE back in the day. They were, they were in, in and out, uh, if you see what I mean, rather than uh, direct. I was in a Aviva, you know, the Gherkin. Yeah. It was, it was um, a serious negotiation taking place on the 23rd of December, particularly. I mean, you, know, you remember it because it was the day before Christmas Eve. And I get the call that a severance negotiation had broken down. Could I come in and represent one of the executives? As I was just cracking open a bottle of champagne, put it down, jump in the car, get down there. And I'm in my civvies because it's 23rd, lunchtime, and we're off. So I get down, I sit there and I'm... And I'm told I'm going to be negotiating with the chairman of Aviva. Not met him before. And I'm sitting there, I register at the desk, and they say to me, um, there's a special lift over there in the corner that's just for the chairman. His PA will come down and pick you up and take you up there. There's about 38,000 other lifts, but this is, and I thought, hmm, tell me a little bit about the culture, right? So I sit down there. And after about 20 minutes, she was obviously the chairman's PA. She looked, she carried herself with a dignity and an integrity. You just knew, you know, the two-piece black suit, the pearls, everything. She just looked it, the part, professional, proper. And she floated across the floor. She comes over and she goes to the desk and they point her in my direction. And there's me and there's a guy sitting next to me who's a courier in Lycra with a cycling cap and that bleeping walkie-talkie thing. And he's got a satchel over his arm. And she came over and she stood in front of us and shock horror. Which one's Rene Carriol? And I couldn't believe this. And she could see her, the dilemma. She's looking left and right and I'm thinking, do I make it easy? No, I'm, why don't I just lean back and enjoy this? And after what seemed like a lifetime, but it could be no more than about six seconds, she chose the courier. She had Mr. Carriel, and he went, pardon? She had Mr. Carriel, and I said, I think you'll find that's me. She just froze. But I'm gonna take advantage of this now, because I'm gonna go and do a hell of a negotiation. So as we walk into the lift and she's wanting to die, I say to her, so what's the chairman like then? How do I get onto his good side? What do I need to do to ensure that we have a, she said, um, he's got a great sense of humour. Crack a joke early on and you'll have him. When I got in, I cracked a joke early on, I had him. Oh, brilliant. Never get angry. No, no. well, in business, is it survival of the fittest or survival of the funniest? Fabulously insightful question. If you want to survive, and the law of the jungle, and it's just the fittest. But if you want to thrive, 
If you want to do more than survive, you want to thrive. Then don't take yourself too seriously. Take a moment to share a laugh with a few people. That's where you go beyond surviving to thriving. And I think it's a combination. You've got to be good at your job. You've got to be able to deliver. You've got to do all those sort of things. But I think the bit, and I, I put humour on the same length as EQ, emotional intelligence. And, you know, it's those who walk into the room and instinctively, you know, I've got to take this down a notch or two. This is get, all getting a bit too tense. And especially when you're... And, and especially now, I'm seeing now that we've got strange, what I call strange bedfellows. Rivals are having to work together, working on a vaccine together. So, you know, is it Novartis working with AstraZeneca? How do you walk into that room and get rid of the tensions and make people loosen up a bit to work together? And I'll say collaborations and new leadership. Humour works. And especially if you're as long in the tooth I'm, I've worked with AstraZeneca, I've worked with Novartis. And I can say things they can't say. I'll say, um, you guys are near geniuses. If only you had personalities. And I can say, you know, you guys, I've never seen people who make as much money. If only you'd share a bit of it and just break the ice, bring them together a bit. And they'll laugh a bit nervously. And then when the laughs start to become real, we're in, aren't we? Oh, when the laughs start to become real. I love that. Um, we're going to do some quick fire questions, sisters, where before we close up, I uh, will have we'll just have some fun with this one, two word, three word answers, whatever you like. Actually, there are no rules in the quick fire questions. So who's the funniest person you've met? John Cleese, probably. Yeah, which is why we were, earlier on, it just made me laugh. He is just brilliant, even in real life. He just can't help himself. Just funny. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Funny. Oh, okay. Nobody wants to be the cleverest man in the room. No. What book makes you laugh? There's a book called A Confederacy of Dunces, John Kennedy Tool. It's the funniest. I can't even get past the first page. <laughs> I read it at the end of every year. I read it again. It's A Confederacy of Dunces. You must read it. What film makes you laugh? Blazing Saddles. Every oh. time wet myself every time and I, I know the, you know when i know the gag's coming and i still laugh out loud it, it, and i'm a big monty python fan as well genius what word makes you laugh pardon pardon you know pardon pardon you know, <laughs> it's so euphemistic we can use it to tell you off we can do it to the rejoinder pardon means a million different things in a million different moments and on the way you say, I can use pardon for a thousand different outcomes. What's not funny? Sorry about this. Racism. All the isms, in fact. Sexism. Racism. All the isms aren't funny. We're at a moment where we're starting to push back the tide of the isms. So to me, none of the isms are funny. And we shouldn't take them as funny. Let's just get rid of them. Desert Island gags. If you could only take one joke with you to a desert island what would that joke be Rene? do you know when i when i was a kid um when i was at got to university um the present my dad sent me was an lp of monty python live at drury lane i still got it it still scratches and the joke that makes my eyes what is the four yorkshiremen Oh, you know, you know, yeah. you know the classic for Yorkshireman. Ah, uh, ah, of course I do. Yeah, yeah. you were lucky. Luxury. Luxury. It's just the joke, and I've heard it told in so many different accents, so many different ways, in so many countries, and it gets me every time. For Yorkshireman. For Yorkshireman. Love that. Absolutely love that. Um, uh, by the way, I was there when the four Yorkshiremen, and to tie up two things you've said, you said John Cleese and the four Yorkshiremen sketch. I was there at Drury Lane. I think I was about 10 or 11 years wow. old, having been taken by my guitar teacher, Henry Marsh. And I was sat, in the, the first row in the stalls was uh, the first few rows in the stalls, and then there's a, a gap. And at one point, John Cleese 
came down the aisle dressed as an usher, with holding, you know, the thing they used to hold for ice cream. Oh, yes, yes. And he had a, 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 a pelican on there. Oh, no, no, he had a puffin, or did he? And he goes, puffin, who, or pelican, who wants your pelican? Get your pelican here. And I stroked it, and he looked at me and went, do you want a puffin on a stick? <laughs> and it was like I'd been touched by comedy gods, you know, just uh, the, being there and like that. Because of him that you've had this as part of your essential being since. And this, this podcast and the work you're doing, bringing humour back, I would say, back into the workplace as part of the workplace, part of what we do, essential. And, you know, in these four times, I, I'm doing a load of work at the moment, I say that there's three things that people are looking for. A bit of clarity, a bit of certainty, a bit of hope. And what you're doing with humour brings hope back to everyone. And as I keep saying to people, if all you've brought to the problem is hope, You've done your job already. Well done to you, sir. Oh, well, Rene, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I love that you left it on clarity, certainty and hope. I hope that we get a chance to do this again because your clarity and your certainty around business and humour has been a joy to witness. Thank you so much again. My privilege, my friend. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production. <laughs>